Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day we learn how businesses and indeed individuals are leveraging technology to deliver greater value and unlock opportunities. But today, I want to do a little good old-fashioned virtual crystal ball gazing. For example, what if you or your business could look into the future? So when I was thinking about a question like that, I came across a company called DeckTech, which is a behavioral science consultancy where they help clients predict future market responses by applying their insights across far-reaching sectors, including banking, telecoms and retail, and so much more. Essentially, at DeckTech, they model human behaviour to reveal the responses to different scenarios, which ultimately gives their clients a major edge over their competitors in choices across range, pricing, communications, offers, and that list goes on and on. So learning more about the future before it happens is something that would be valuable to all of us. But I also want to find out a little bit more about the technology that makes all that possible. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to London so we can speak with Dr. Henry Stott from DeckTech. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Well, thanks very much for having uh, me, Neil. My background originally is sort of maths and uh, cog sci, and I actually really only ever had two jobs. <laughs> so uh, I started out at a strategy consulting firm that some of your listeners may know called Oliver Wyman, but it's very big now, but I joined it um, back in the late 80s uh, when it was just 20 people. And then after that, about 20 years ago, we co-founded uh, DeckTech um, with uh, – a guy called uh, Nick Chater, who's um, a professor at Warwick University, who I met via my PhD. So what we do is, um, DeckTech is all about forecasting and predicting how people will behave under new circumstances. Um, and But alongside that, uh, it's a business that's an angel investor in various technology firms, including finance and retail, which is sort of um, an interesting uh, insight into uh, applications of technology in, in communities, as you describe. Um, And then somewhat improbably, alongside all of that, I think listeners may have read The Think Tank, which is a football column in The Times, um, which which we do. Deck Tech is known as a behavioral science consultancy, but can you tell me a little bit more about those kind of problems you're solving with technology? And maybe tell me a little bit more about that think tank in in The the Daily Times as well, because I think that will bring, bring to life the kind of thing that you do. I think, as I was saying earlier, there's a great quote from Larry Page, um, the Google founder, saying, you know, lots of companies don't succeed. Um, and what they basically get wrong is that they miss the future. So understanding the future is really important. Um, and um, so the behavioral science consultancy, the behavioral science part of it is really about getting a more accurate insight into what's going to happen, uh, how, how things are going to pan out. Um, in that sense, in a practical commercial environment, that that's about helping assess new product development, acquisition journey design, war gaming competitor scenarios, and all that sort of stuff. Peering into the future to try and understand how non, uh, unprecedented things will play out. But it also can be applied to social questions. Just thinking of technology and community a bit. Um, so you know you can use it to um, help optimize a charitable proposition or you can explore a regulatory environment. And indeed, um, during the lockdown, we've been uh, studying um, uh, how people, how the lockdown guidance has influenced behaviors, how we think those behaviors will change once the lockdown is over and so, so on and so forth. So it's all about peering into the future, but with this special behavioral lens. Um, the football side of it, the think tank side of it, is, is different, uh, categorically different in ways I can elaborate on later. Um, but the, it's, that is m- more about pure data science and trying to look through um, all the, every kick of the ball across every league 
and say, okay, if I take this player from this team and put them in this other team, what what will happen? Um, that's that's really the the, the main uh, question that one addresses, which I suppose at some level is appearing into the future problem too. It is. And there was that film Moneyball a few years ago where a, a guy did something very similar with a baseball team. Do you think we'll ever reach a point where a football manager could do something similar using data by assembling a team of, of people that wouldn't necessarily fit or you would put together, but the data suggests that they would? Well, I think that's happening. We are very much part of that movement. So that's, that is that is entirely possible. Quite, quite how effective it is, is a, a question. But um, you know, for example, one of the people who worked with us has gone off to uh, work at Liverpool and, um, and they are doing very well. And uh, we worked for a long, number of years with Spurs and during the period we've worked with them, they've done very well. So uh, I think there's empirical evidence that it can be done. But, you know, you can, you can, there are better and worse ways of peering into the future. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, they are not all, all equal. And yeah, at some level, the better ones are, give you an, an amazing competitive advantage. And apologies for asking this, but for anyone with a curious mind out there, when it comes to looking into the future through that through that behavioural lens and looking at research, why can't we just ask people what they would do? I, know, I appreciate it's a very simplistic question, but what are your, your views on that? Well, the, there's, there's two answers to that question, really, which are fairly fundamental to you know, what it is to be a human, human being um, and, you know, the, the psychology of that. And the, the first one is that um, people's self-report is remarkably unreliable. So if you've got, I mean, going back to the commercial environment, if you've got a new product or you're going to change some feature or you're going to change your acquisition journey and you just ask people what they think, what you tend to get is a heavily edited response. So uh, the, the, the sort of classic example of this is the way people will, Misreport their um, uh, so misreport things for social justification reasons, like ethical purchasing. And we've done a lot of research over the years that that will demonstrate how people would like to buy ethical features, like you know, uh, sustainably caught tuna or whatever it would be, and they will tend to overemphasize those things when you just ask them. And then in practice, when you look at their behaviors. How, what they actually purchase and what the um, you know ha- what kind of premium they're prepared to pay for ethical features. I mean, they are prepared to pay a premium, premium, but it's not as big as they will claim when you ask them outright. And so that's the sort of first reason people are incentivized not to really tell you what they think. And then a, a more profound reason that I was alluding to earlier is that actually people just don't know. They don't have private ex- access to what they're thinking and why they're thinking it. Um, and, and there's a great book by my colleague, uh, Dick Chater, called The Mind is Flat that goes into this in great detail. But I'll give you just one example, um, which has got the great, uh, the great title of Free Floating Effect. So um, it was 1974, I think, uh, around that, when um, the, this pair of researchers at the University of British Columbia did this study where um, they had uh, female interviewers go and interview male participants in an experiment. And at the end of the task, they'd go, if you've got any questions, um, here's my number, call me, uh, to, to, and I can ask, answer your questions about this experiment. And the, um, the randomized controlled trial aspect of this was that the male respondents had come off high bridges in one case, because there's a very high suspension bridge running across the gorge at the University of British Columbia, or a low bridge, which is at the bottom of the gorge, and it's not, not, not one, nowhere near as, um, as sort of a scary, in effect. So you've got male participants who are adrenalized coming off the high bridge because it's a scary suspension bridge, and you've got low adrenalized uh, male respondents coming off the low bridge. And sure enough, a statistically significantly higher number of male participants on the high bridge scenario made the call to the female interviewer. So what's happening there is that people don't know why they act. They don't have private access to why they're acting in that circumstance. What's happened is they've got this free-floating adrenaline coming off the bridge, and then they meet this person, and they're like, hmm, I'm adrenalized. I must be attracted to this person. They don't have they don't have the insight on why the adrenaline was there. Uh, it's hence the, t- the title free-floating effect. That's just one example of many, 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 many papers 
that demonstrate that people don't really understand why they behave the way they do. So you can't ask them outright because they just don't know. So with that in mind then, can you tell me a little bit more about how you guys are using technology to model human behavior that reveals the responses in those different scenarios? Well, technology plays a really important role. And, you know, as an analyst who started out in the, 90, in the 1980s, uh, it is a, a radically different environment today. Um, and so, I mean, our main approach to solving these problems um, is a tool we call Behavior Lab. Uh, and Behavior Lab is essentially an immersive uh, online experience that replicates the real world sort of decision environment that people would face as closely as possible and then puts different people through different versions of that reality. So in that sense, it's a randomized control trial like that bridge study. Um, but the key thing here is that we're making people, putting people in a similar situation as possible and then we're watching their behaviors. At no point during that do we ever ask them, oh, you know, wh why do you think you did that? You know, why do you think you called that person? Do you think you're in love with them? Or do you think you're adrenalized because you came off the bridge? All we do is we simply put people through a different, these different uh, control versions of a thing, and then, and then we see how they behave on the other side. And technology is really crucial for that because the technology exists today so that you can actually replicate the real-world environment quite well. Technology has obviously been very helpful in digitizing much of uh, commerce so that actually – these online environments are where many of these decisions are now being taken uh, so that replicating them becomes even more um, uh, high fidelity, as it were. And, of course, technology greatly facilitates all of the uh, modeling that gets uh, done downstream. So once you've done these experiments, you have to run statistical analysis and make forecasts and calibrate it to real-world outcomes and all that sort of good stuff. And, um, and all that is just uh, transformationally uh, better than it used to be. Uh, in terms of the sophistication of the models you can build, the accuracy, uh, the, the speed with which you can turn all that around and all the rest of it. So in business terms, then, in, in what way are you able to give clients a, a major edge over their competitors? Because that, that was going to be the real value point, isn't it, for businesses, especially now in the, the current climate? Well, I think that's right. I mean, and particularly in the current climate, as you say, perhaps times have never been quite as uncertain. It's very hard to peer into the future and um, we have been reasonably busy during the lockdown, in fact, uh, helping various retail clients sort of you know, peer into what Q4 may look like this year, and preparing for Christmas if you're a retailer and all the rest of it. So it's, um, it's, it's highly uncertain times. Um, and of course, the kinds of methods we're describing here are basically more accurate ways of forecasting that future and also provide you with the ability to play different scenarios out. So the edge there, in effect, is uh, you can be more accurate in your predictions. You can explore what the alternatives are. Uh, you can test things more quickly. It's more agile. Um, and also, you know, you can uh, test uh, you know, lots of things that don't currently exist. Uh, so, I mean, in particular, uh, just stepping away from the kind of the uncertainty of the future situation. I mean, there are lots of situations where um, you might want to do a live trial uh, which is, you know, a form of randomized control trial, and it's immersive, and I, I'm a big fan of them. But so, certain kinds of life trial, you, you know, you just can't do because you, know, you want to, you don't want to do something in a public environment because it's still still a secret product, or uh, you know, you haven't got the technology yet in place, and it's quite a big investment to deliver that kind of feature, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the edge, the edge comes from the accuracy. The edge comes from the the the, you know, the number of different things you can test, the sort of scale and turnarounds, but it also comes from just being able to do things that don't yet exist um, and explore different scenarios, as I say. And when we're talking about that behavioural lens, I'm curious, what factors drive people's behaviour and, and decision-making? Is there any insights you can share around that? Well, I mean, it, uh, that's a very big question. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and, and there isn't really one answer and uh, many PhDs in it. But the, um, I, I think from our perspective, there are, I mean, we do have a different house view, as it were, um, on, on that. And, and it's probably worth highlighting where we uh, mostly detach from sort of common, you know, the common received wisdom, as it were. And, um, and that very much relates back to the things I was saying earlier about how people can't, don't really know why they do things. And, uh, and and they can't really answer those questions. So I think the, the you know our first point on you know, what drives people behavior is 
is that the context is really all consuming and just just like that high bridge low bridge you know people are not aware of how the context is influencing their decision making but it is remarkably influential uh there's a lovely study where um you have people uh paying their credit card and um in one version of the experiment the minimum payment is foregrounded and in the other version the minimum payment is harder to find and what you find is where the minimum payment is foregrounded the amount of the credit card that people pay down is lower because the decision has been framed by this lower minimum payment whereas where they're not so aware of the minimum payment or they may have missed it they tend to be more fixated on the actual outstanding balance and they will tend to pay more of it off so you see that any way you manipulate the decision making environment has this great impact on how decisions are made and then there are other things about decision making which are again not so um uh, what you might you might like to think that you have these reasons for doing things but actually that much more superficial so you know behavior is often driven by just sheer self consistency um and also looking at what other people do so being consistent with yourself but being consistent with what other people do so you're you're seeking to uh, basically benchmark um and then and, and through all of this i suppose the other thing that drives behavior is a not because I think if you're us, you don't really think that people have much personality. <laughs> like we don't, we don't really think that people have much in terms of their intrinsic preference. I mean, there's a bit of stuff in there. There's a bit of wiring, a bit of innate preference for this and that. But largely, we think that personalities are historical accidents, and that um, and that therefore, you know, people's purchasing behavior, their decision making is really driven by what they did in the past, whether it worked for them or not. Um, how consistent they are with what other people are doing what the decision environment is telling them etc so um so i think the headline is quite superficial actually <laughs> uh you know what factors drive people's decision making yeah quite superficial nothing profound nothing in there already no library of preferences to draw upon and it does seem that you've got this wide range of tools there, this, this huge tool set there to look into the future and try and predict it. But what alternative methods are there when, that you need when trying to predict the future effectively, would you say? So periods of the future, there are, two, there are fundamentally two classes of problem. The first class of problem is a precedented peer into the future. So that's the equivalent of saying, well, you know, people have gone bankrupt in the past or people have churned in the past or players have transferred in the past. And I'm going to look at the historical data and analyze that using data science techniques to then uh, in effectively interpolate what I think is going to happen in this situation. So in the future, which of these people is going to churn? In the future, which of these people are going to default? In the future, how well is this player transfer going to work out? So that's kind of a precedented future, future problem. <laughs> so the future looks quite a lot like the past, and I'm trying to just color in the gaps and figure out what's going to happen when this novel thing happens, um, but the novel thing has all these precedents. And then the second class of problem is there's not really ever been anything like this before. What's going to happen? So I can't really go back to other data sets because this product was never in the market or we never had a lockdown, or we never have you know we never had this kind of guidance before, et cetera. We're in completely new situations, and there you know there are a variety of traditional techniques, and those traditional techniques are you know things like focus groups, interviewing people, quant research, and then revealed preference methods like uh, conjoint and max diff, and then live trialing where you go out into the field and actually try stuff out, and um, and you know and those methods all have their advantages in different contexts. But th those are the sort of alternative methods for looking into the future where there's really never been anything like it before. And I'm curious, especially for the business leaders and decision makers listening, w w how accurate are these methods? And uh, have you got any examples of, of before and after where you've been able to measure that, that the kind of effectiveness of this? Well, I think it's a really good question. And um, uh, Ray Dalio, the uh, hedge fund uh, billionaire, yeah. had this quote where he said, you know, listening to uninformed people is worse than having no answers at all, <laughs> which uh, is, uh, I think, very true. So, I mean, accuracy is really important. And the methods I'm describing, like interviews and focus groups, suffer from the problem that they are very reliant on self-report, which I was ragging on earlier. So, you know, if you're me, you know, I think those kinds of interviews and asking people what they think 
is, is, is kind of helpful for getting a sense of the lay of the land, under, understanding the decision context, perhaps for generating ideas, not so good for filtering through different proposition ideas where you've got a lot of money riding on the problem. And then, you know, the reveal preference methods that I was describing, they are heavily industrialized sort of methods, and therefore they lack all the context. So I was saying before, context is really important in decision making. So, you know, reveal preference methods like conjoint, no one ever really buys a product or does a task in the way that those research methods use. So they, again, you know, there are accurate accuracy problems. So I think if the end, if you're me, the, the, the fundamentally most accurate method and the best way to do evidence-based management um, is to do randomized controlled trials. And those can be live trials um, like A-B testing or uh, all those kinds of things, uh, field uh, shelf edge trials, regional trials, et cetera, or the kind of behavior lab online immersive trial that I was describing earlier that we specialize in. Um, I mean, live trials have their issues, don't get me wrong. I mean, quite often they're executed poorly is the main problem. Um, and they will be, you know, I, we see lots of live trials run in our clients where there's no control, uh, they don't run enough um, volume, so the, the results get swamped by field noise. There's lots of field noise out there. Um, they don't trap all the outcomes of interest that you'd want to know about uh, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so you're kind of limited, and in live trials, fundamentally, you're limited to doing things that you can do. You can't test really novel things that you haven't built yet or you haven't negotiated and so on. And that's kind of like where Behavior Lab comes in. But, um, but yeah, I think when you use live trials, when you use these behavioral methods, the accuracy is really good. Uh, you really, you, you know, you've diagnosed the causality accurately. You uh, have measured the size of the effect. You, know, you, don't, you don't suffer from some of the problems that data science suffer from where, you know, the, the famous phrase is correlation is not causation. And you can spot relationships in data that actually when you then try and pull the lever and, and, and capitalize on them don't actually uh, give you the financial outcome you're aiming for. And live trials and randomized, randomized control trial methods just don't suffer from those problems. So they're very accurate. They're as accurate as it gets, I think. And I completely understand how valuable this is to businesses, but I've got to ask, what's in it for brands and consumers? Well, the, the brands sort of get the obvious stuff, you know, faster, yeah. cheaper, more accurate predictions. That's why I would always steer them in the direction of randomized control trials, live trials, behavior lab, that kind of thing. But I mean, in, in practice, what they get is they, they make the right financial decision. Often, actually, in our clients, what we see is that having the kind of evidence uh, not just help, not only makes you, helps you make the right decision, but it increases your confidence in a decision. And that helps a lot with organizational mobilization. I mean, a lot of our clients often sort of make the right decisions, but they don't double down hard enough on the decision. And, um, and you know, therefore they don't uh, execute quickly or they don't execute hard enough and all this sort of thing. So I think what they get out of it can be those things. And also to some degree, management of external stakeholders. But of course, you know, in the school of how's technology helping, um, the world, not just uh, uh, corporations. There's a consumer side to this. And I, I think the more accurate your methods are, the more things you can test. Basically, the better the world is that you can build for consumers. I mean, what we're really aiming to create here is a more ergonomic world for them, where consumers are getting offered the products that they want, where the products have the features and dimensionality to them, so that people are able to uh, personalize uh, what they purchase uh, to be more along the lines of what fits with what they would like and and to do all that in an increasingly frictionless journey and I, I think if you look at the you, you know all, all the sort of tremendous uses of technology particularly in the retail environment and you know the success of uh, you know notable success of various uh, retailers they have all been about those kinds of outcomes very consumer focused making sure that they've got, uh, they're have got, they not offering people things they don't want. They are offering things people do want. They allow people to customize uh, nicely, and they make the whole thing really easy. Uh, so, you know, obviously you're thinking of examples here like, you know, the, the beautiful designs uh, that Apple turn out or, you know, the, sort of the simplicity of the Amazon um, Prime experience and, and all that kind of stuff. 
those are the kinds of things I think that can come out from a customer perspective. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate we've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time here. So for anyone that would like to find out more information about the kind of thing that you're doing and stay up to speed with the work that you're doing as well in the future, what's the best way of doing that and contacting your team if they've got any questions? Well, we have we have a website, um, so you can go. There are various uh, case studies that sort of amplify um, some of the some of the examples I've been talking about here. Um, and uh, also, you can um, sign up there. We do a semi annual brief, uh, which um, is uh, again sort of talks about something current. Uh, the most recent one was about uh, what's going to happen after the pandemic, uh, which um, got published various places, including the Times. The other thing you can do, of course, is just follow us on LinkedIn or come and find me and and uh, follow me on LinkedIn uh, where you know, we publish periodically these things on there too. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing with me today all the examples here and the great work you're doing and how you're using technology to solve real problems for businesses. And at the end of this podcast, I might be asking you who's going to win the Premier League next year. But apart from that, thanks for joining me today. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Once again, so much value in that conversation for me. And me personally, I just loved exploring what factors drive people's behavior and decision making. What alternative methods are there to predict the future? And also, how accurate are these methods and what's in it for brands and consumers? These are the questions that we all need answering. And big thank you to Dr. Henry Stott for patiently answering my questions there. But I know you all have a curious mind. So if there's any questions that you feel that we missed or you'd like answering, whether it be about today's podcast or anything at all, or even maybe you just want to share a few insights, I'm the easiest guy in the world to find. So email me techblogwriter at outlook.com. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk, where you'll find links to all my social channels and over 1,300 podcast interviews. But other than that... If you want to look further into the future, I'll be here. Same time, same place tomorrow, and we'll do it all again. So thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.